wonderful. And you, just, just look at us. So, um, just a second. Minute you, you are recording, right? I mean, the rest of the meeting, right? John, you in the back? I know it's beyond your job description, but could you just open the door and see if Don's in there, please? <laughs> we know he was here earlier. Oh, okay. I just want to be sure that you, the, because mm -hmm. the opening of the meeting needs to be public. Okay. Good after good afternoon, uh, everyone. We're um, opening up our um, first meeting of the fall season. We've been on so-called vacation, I think, for the uh, since our July meeting, and um, hope that everyone has had a good summer. Um, so I welcome back Leslie Moriarty, um, Andy Deuce, and Jeff Raymer. So. Welcome. Um, we are going to uh, begin our meeting today, which I think will be a fairly lengthy one, with an executive session to discuss pending litigation. And so at this point in time, I will ask um, our motion to go into executive session. I'll make a motion that we go into an executive session to discuss pending litigation. I second that. And Andy seconds it. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. It's 107. 107 into executive session. So that was Jeff and Andy. So I ask anyone who is not involved in this particular. Okay, I, no power. Jeff, is there power here? Settlement of Century National Insurance versus the town of Greenwich. Uh, yeah, we should be specifying the dollar figure now. Yep, we do. Uh, 11,554.33. 11, oh, sorry. Uh, specifying the dollar amount, 11,554.33. You're okay with that amount, Leslie? Um, those in favor? Aye. Four zero zero. Um, SC2 um, from the Law Department, the settlement of Cincinnati Insurance versus the Town of Greenwich. Do I have a motion? Uh, so move for, um, so move for $10,120.63. Seconded. Those in favor? Aye. Four zero. Okay, SC3, again from the Law Department. Um, the uh, settlement of um, AIG property versus the town of Greenwich. So moved for $16,050.91. Jeff, was anyone yeah, yeah, I, I had, I know it's a penny, but I had 90 cents, not 91. Uh, but whatever, I second it. Okay. Leslie, Leslie's agreeable to whatever that penny is. I'm agreeable to is. whatever the right number is. Um, those in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero zero. Okay, the um, SE four from Law Department settlement of Mill Pond Company versus the Town of Greenwich. So moved for twenty four thousand three hundred and seventy dollars and ten cents. Seconded. Okay, are those in favor? Aye. Four zero zero. Okay. So this one SE five the Law Department the settlement of Three Ledge Road. FEMA 
disallowance. Um, do we have a motion for that? And then do we want to just add a statement into the uh, minutes? Which well, I'll make a motion to uh, settle that uh, for 90000 uh, plus uh, question. Are we encouraging or requesting that the law department pursue collection from the homeowner? From the uh, I, I'd accept all that and second it. What? Which word would you like to use? Uh, I say urging, or so it might be the middle ground. Urging, urging the yeah. law department. Yeah. To collect from the homeowner. Is that what the words were? Yeah. To 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 to, to pursue a claim against the homeowner. Okay. Wilson, you're, you're okay with that? Yes, I'm sure. fine okay. with that. Those in favor? Aye. Four zero zero. One more. What? Um, then we have SE6 for the law department, a settlement of Allstate versus Vin Cole and Pound Greenwich. It's two separate ones, I believe. Yeah, so um, I'll make that motion for a payment of $7,491.63 to Allstate and $842.62 to plaintiff or Ms. Baca. Baca. Okay, is there a second for that? Seconded. Aye. 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 Favor? <laughs> for, no, I was just trying to, you know. Yeah. It's fine. Catch up here. I know you are. Thank you. Just making sure we, we have everything. Okay, so um, finally, and I thank everyone for being very patient. First, we'll thank um, Barbara and Abby and, and the team for coming and, and um, briefing us and, and uh, bringing to closure six uh, pending um, cases that we had. So thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. it. And all your time. Um, okay, so now um, we are on GEMS, um, GM2. It's an additional appropriation, uh, capital appropriation for their um, GEM Station 4 up on King Street. And so we have, would you like to come up? I guess we have to bring an extra chair. We don't have, um, you have to come up by the microphone. And you can socially distance somehow. Yeah. I don't know if Tracy, do you want to stay there? Are you okay? Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, welcome, um, Al Manelli. Welcome back from summer. Um, and also welcome Andy Fox, um, who's um, working with GEMS in terms of this project. So thank you for the work you're doing with GEMS. So. You went out to bid, and you're going to tell us what happened. We had uh, four responsive bidders. The low bid was at one million five thirty-seven. Um, the highest bidder was two million two twenty-eight, and we had two bidders in between. Uh, the other two bidders were under two million dollars. And so you are asking us to do what? To pay for the difference and provide a contingency to build the building. And uh, um, it's your intent to move ahead with the lowest bidder, which is what yeah, I guess is required, we, we would, right? What we would do is, once we obtain the funds, we would uh, start to do our due diligence with the low bidder, um, make sure that he can um, produce um, the proper references for the type of construction and all his insurance documentations and performance bonds. So you need, need the funding before you do that due diligence? We could actually start at the same time. Okay. We could do is, it concurrently. Is, yeah. is according to Mr. Brannion, he, as long as the BET approves the funding subject to the RTM, we can then start that process in parallel with the caveat that the contract can't be executed the until RTM. the RTM formally approves it. Exactly. So, um, and we realize you don't meet till the end of this month for a formal, and if we don't get it on this month's agenda, 
it won't be until December. And we have the building permit, so the idea would be to have the contract ready to go so we could then start construction 1st of November. Okay. Leslie? Yeah, um, it's interesting. So the risk you run is that that particular low bidder doesn't qualify, and then you'll need to come back for a yeah. second discussion for a different dollar amount. Um, but it's your you're fairly confident or as much as you can be that this low bid will prevail? The company, the low bidder, has worked for the town in the past, although not in the last 10 years. And they did some difficult jobs. They worked on that particular bidder, worked on a project in Great Captain's Island um, that was very difficult. And, and they performed well. They performed well. Okay. And I believe okay. with the increased contingency it covers if we have to go to the second bidder. Well, no, because it, we, we, we'd want there to be a contingency there, too. Well, no, that's what I'm saying is we figured by raising the contingency from 10% to 15%, oh. that 5% would allow us to go to the second bidder. So your, your original request of a million four ten uh, that, that included a contingency. Was Correct. that contingency at 10 or 15%? 000. I don't recall. What was the contingency at the at the million four ten? Was it ten percent? One twenty nine. Pardon? One hundred twenty nine thousand. Uh, so that was fifteen percent then too. It was ten. Oh, ten. Ten of the yeah. construction costs. And and f s based on our discussions with Al and Ben, if we raise it to fifteen percent, um, it solves the issue. We have to go to the second low bidder. Because it gets you up to 1.768 for total appropriation if this full amount is approved. Um, I found it interesting how varied the prices were for each of the line items on the uh, on the responses of the it, bids. So you it's... can't make any <laughs> sense of it. I mean, I took leveled the two low bidders, and they have dollars put in different categories. And assuming one likes it's it's part of their bidding strategy, I should say. Okay, thank you, okay. Andy. Uh, are you at risk with the uh, next lowest bidder if uh, if you spend time with the first bidder? Uh, the is that second lowest bid in hand for a period of time, or, or does it go away when you accept the all first the, bidder? All the bids, all the bids on this on this particular RFB, we're held for 120 days. Uh, even if you accept one or start talking with one of the four? Uh, the we would, we would um, the most we would do is send a letter of intention. Okay. Purchasing would send a letter of intention to make sure that he can get all his performance bonds and his insurance in. And while you're doing that, these other three bids remain good for, for the full 120 days. Until uh, okay. the actual signing of the contract, the bids are still in play. And the 120 days runs from the 8th of September? Yes. Okay. The day the bid was due. Do, does the project timing get impacted because of this um, hiccup in, uh, in the well, bid responses? Well, it's definitely going to push out the start date. Right. But, I mean, if, if best case, we're going to start in the 1st of October just to get their contract signed and mobilization. So it, this is going to cost us about a month to six weeks. Okay. Thank you. So may I just ask, where is the um, low bidder located in, in terms of? Where is the, you know, the domicile? No, oh, I'm sorry. Where is the domicile of the um, lowest bidder here? Are they local? Epipon? Oh, Epipon, they're from Milford, Connecticut. From Milford? Yeah. And then what about the second lowest? Um, we have never done business with that company. I'm not quite sure if they're a Westchester company or a Connecticut company. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? Nope. Nope. Leslie, Andy, more questions? No. Do we want to um, wait and approve or whatever these, or do we want to just do it now? No, let's do it now. Okay. Yeah. Do, I, do I have any yeah, motion? I, I, I'm going to move that we uh, approve the item. Uh, and I'm going to call it non-routine. It would mean that you would need to come back to the full BET because there may be some further questions there at the at the full BET money next week. Okay. I'll second. 
as non-routine. Okay. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Okay, so we have Roland, I think. We have information technology. This was a transfer of um, professional services from the capital accounts into the operating account. Do you want to just tell us what yep. it is? When we moved uh, some of the money out of the capital account into the department's operating, we moved all of this money in one lump sum into uh, the account called maintenance rental of uh, software. And Tom Klein would like to break that out because he had some of this cybersecurity work uh, requires uh, professional services. So he asked that uh, some of it moved out to $307,000 into the 100s to uh, professional services. They're both operating accounts. Neither one of yes. these are a capital account. Yeah, thank you. So, um, does it, I mean, anyone have any questions on this no, or a motion? So it's moving from the 200s to the 100s, and therefore it needs our approval, right? Yeah, so I would move the item, and I'll I would move it as routine. I'll second as routine. Okay, as routine. Okay, those in favor? Aye. Aye. So that's four zero zero. Roland, will you just email Tom, please, and, and Tom Klein, please, and let him know that at least you got through this one as um, routine. Did we forget to let to notify the police officer to no. come? No. So the next one. Oh, oh, there you are. Okay, sorry. The next one is um, our police department. Uh, Bob, um, we have the police department coming. Um, Bob Barry. Bob Barry for um, a request for. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon. Welcome. Sorry that we've been pretty busy here. No worries. Um, for an additional appropriation for forensic testing of. Uh, $9,600, and this is from your forfeiture account. Correct. We're requesting that uh, funny, uh, money out of the uh, f asset forfeiture fund in order to do some additional uh, DNA testing that's not available to us through the state lab. So when you say it's not available at the state lab, this is just like going to the private sector, or does it go to another state? It's going to a, uh, a private lab that will do testing. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the state lab is not quite doing all of the advanced testing that's available right now. Um, so we want to pursue all of those uh, open venues, uh, and we have uh, a couple of state or uh, uh, private labs that will provide us those uh, specialized testing. And um, you know, are they in the state of Connecticut? Or I mean, you know, just are we just uh, the two of them that I think we're looking at, or not? No. Okay, great. So we're Jeff. paying. We're paying. So th th this is a great little fund of money Kennedy. out of which. On a case-by-case -case basis, you, you can know, hire an outside lab to do some testing where DNA uh, evidence is relevant to your case. We're actually looking at some specific cases, uh, and there are actually uh, some uh, major crimes that we're uh, uh, investigating where we think this um, additional testing will benefit uh, uh, the conclusion of the case. Is it beyond the pale? I, 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 I'm going to ask a question that's certainly out of my pay grade, and it might be out of your pay grade too, but I'll ask it anyway. Is it beyond the pale for us to be uh, looking into what would it take for us to have the capability in-house in our forensic capability mm -hmm. to be able to do be doing DNA testing without using an outside lab? That would be cost prohibitive. Um, okay. Doesn't, that, that, not too logical, efficient. Okay. Thank you. That was the question. I have nothing else. This is a question for um, Mr. Geiger and, and Mr. Minarski, just on authority. Is this considered a transfer within the police department as opposed to an additional appropriation? A lot of times it's almost the same thing. Just We have the money in, in hand in this case, and they're just requesting approval to use the money and creating an appropriation. We're creating an appropriation either Does way, whatever we call it. Does it require RTM approval? No. no this uh, is so it's more like a we have, transfer. We have res resolution, I believe, Leslie pointed out, it's up to okay. twenty thousand dollars a year. Yeah, um, up to twenty thousand dollars a year. We have a budget resolution. I want, offhand, I want to say it's budget resolution twenty four, but I might be okay. wrong. Um, Thank you um, for but we can approve up to um, twenty thousand dollars in cumulative in a year without it going to the RTM. And uh, it, it, since that's cumulative, to uh, Leslie um, M's point. Perhaps we should call this an, a, 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 a transfer. Uh, transfer, not an appropriation. Well, I think in the, you have to go back and look at the budget resolution. I think it, it requires an appropriation. But it, 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 
we are created a, we are creating an appropriation. So the only other term we could use is a additional appropriation if we don't want to use approval to use. Yeah, these are funds that are coming in from the outside anyway, so it's over approval to these, use. These are funds that are in the triple R accounts. Yes. They, over the years, there's two of them. There's the state and there's the federal asset forfeiture accounts. Right. So we have them, they're in triple R, so they sit there. Uh, right. They can go they're over different. more than one year. Right. And uh, the, the police department will come frequently and ask for them. So the answer, uh, Leslie's question, it's, uh, it's, it's actually we're going to create an appropriation. Right. Okay. Um, and do you know offhand about how much is sitting in, is in that uh, triple R account, the uh, forfeiture account? Not offhand, but we could have it for you uh, for Monday. That'll be helpful, I think. Leslie, do you I, want to move the item? I, I, well, I have one question before that. Just is this something that's like one time, um, or is this up to? Right now, again, we're looking at some specific cases, so I would say it was one time, but I, I will not say that we may not come back and say there's additional testing. This technology is uh, improving, changing all the time. There's things that we can do now that we wouldn't even thought of 10, 20, 30 years ago. Right. Um, so I can't say that we won't, you know, come back, but based on right now, no, right on those right particular now. cases that we're looking at it, this is what we think we need. Thank you. I'm sorry, who, who moved? Who was, who was, who was? The motion has been made. I was wondering if Leslie wanted to make the motion. I'm happy to make the motion to approve the appropriation of $9,600. I'd second that, and it, this could be routine, perhaps. Routine, guys? We don't need the... I think so. Okay, Assistant those in Chief favor? Barry to come on Monday? Yeah. No. Aye. Right. We don't. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I think our chairman makes that decision, but likely you won't have to come on Monday. Whatever's so needed. So thank you for coming. Thank, thank you for your for consideration. Thank, thank you, you. For, for being patient. Okay, so... Um, now we're going to go to new business. And so we have um, the economic conditions report. Well, I'm and sorry, we have tag. tag. Oh, my goodness gracious. Is Mike here? Tag, T-A-1. We've got tag, T-A-1. Thank you. So we have with us today um, Mike Miller, who is a very familiar person to us. And um, what, you know, since we don't, we don't have any funds to release, Mike, I was just going to suggest you pick out one page in your presentation, because we've been looking at, at all of this very diligently, um, and just give us, you know, highlights, say, from one page. And then, um, well, you're going to come back to us, I believe, in two months. And so, um, for a subject to, to release at that time. So, why don't you pick out what page you want, and then we'll ask everyone questions, and I know you always have great answers. So why don't we, can you pick out a highlight page? And uh, I'd actually like to uh, uh, focus on page one, uh, okay, which is then the we're... Uh, plan update page, and uh, <clears throat> essentially provide a little more commentary than what is there, but um, we can go into any further detail uh, based on... I'm uh, sure there'll be questions. Based so. on your interest. Thank you. So uh, we were requested, and, and this is something that we were doing in any case, uh, to provide uh, what is our expectation uh, given uh, the changes that we've now seen from when we submitted our, our plan for this year. And when we submitted our plan for this year, we had prepared it in the winter time, uh, you know, the end of 2021, beginning of 2022, made our presentation in February of 2022. And uh, with the advent of uh, uh, the Delta variant and, and the increases in um, uh, uh, COVID in the community, uh, several of our plan expectations in terms of reopenings of businesses that had been closed or expansion of businesses that have opened but were operating at reduced capacity have substantially changed. Uh, with respect to um, with respect to this uh, uptick uh, in the uh, in the COVID virus uh, throughout the community and throughout the country. So uh, with that, uh, we first set out to identify what is our expected uh, total service hours uh, that we would uh, uh, we would see for the current year and. Uh, Initially, we took a look at our feed 
Greenwich program and tried to make a determination of where we would uh, finish the year. Uh, and our expectation now is that we would finish the year at about 4,000 service hours for the Feed Greenwich program. And that compares with the prior year of about uh, just under 6,400 service hours. Um, so uh, it's uh, a little less than 70% of uh, the prior year. Our expectation for the current year in terms of average family deliveries and uh, within each family, uh, it can be anywhere from two to five residents with an average of uh, three plus. Our expectation for the year is now 330 uh, versus our original plan, which was just over, um, uh, actually compared to last year, uh, which was just over 500. Uh, so this is what we're this is what we're currently expecting with our our plan update, uh, just for the feed Greenwich uh, program. When we move beyond Feed Greenwich and focus on other programs uh, that we've had in the past, uh, we are still anticipating that our Dial-A-Ride program uh, will be at or above uh, the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we've had a substantial increase in requests for rides throughout the communities for uh, medical reasons or uh, shopping or or uh, uh, such visits as our, as our uh, residents typically take. And we've really seen a dramatic increase. Uh, we're almost at the pre-pandemic levels. And uh, I think last, last month we were actually uh, uh, just under. We're probably going to be slightly above for the remainder of the year. Uh, as we move into um, uh, several of our other businesses that we had uh, been providing service to pre-pandemic, and in some cases through the pandemic, the YW after school program and the Board of Ed uh, vocational program, uh, we are still seeing some shortfall relative to pre-pandemic. Uh, but uh, with respect to the Y, uh, we're now expecting uh, slightly less than uh, uh, or slightly higher levels slightly less of a shortfall relative to the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, Board of Ed, we uh, are expecting uh, slightly below uh, pre-pandemic levels as well. And with respect to some of the uh, organizations that we don't expect to see any activity uh, throughout this year, uh, the Senior Center and Nathaniel Witherall, um, we, uh, we don't have anything planned for them. With respect to uh, uh, Riverhouse, uh, we are not uh, providing any transportation contracted with Riverhouse. However, uh, where there are individual, and we call them private pay customers, uh, who are interested in uh, attending either Riverhouse or other adult uh, day uh, sessions throughout the community, we will transport them and bill them separately. So we do have some private pay uh, offset to, offsetting uh, some of the river half shortfall. And all of that amounts to the following. If we just set aside Feed Greenwich uh, for the moment, uh, we are rebuilding from a 2021 bottom uh, or uh, floor, if you will, which was under $200,000 of fee revenues associate, program fee revenues associated with non-feed uh, Greenwich activities. Uh, what we are attempting to rebuild is to a number that's over 300,000 uh, for uh, the year, the fiscal year uh, 2023. And the numbers that we uh, expect to achieve uh, during this period and just looking at a little bit of history, in 2019, pre-pandemic, our last, our last fiscal year before uh, the pandemic, uh, we had 394,000, just under 400,000 of program fees that were non-food uh, food delivery related. 
uh, when we moved into 2020 and the, uh, uh, for our fiscal year ending June 30th, the crisis hit in our uh, ninth month, uh, April, uh, late March, uh, mid-March uh, through the end of the year, June. Uh, the program fees were impacted and relative to the 394 from the prior year, 2019, we ended 2020 at $343,000. In 2021, as I mentioned, the floor year, uh, this, this most recent past year, we bottomed out at $142,000 of program fees. And our expectation for the current year is to uh, rebound to a little over 200,000, 220,000 uh, for the uh, year in total uh, based on uh, these uh, uh, assumptions that I've just read. Uh, and as I said, this should set us up and we're working on building new businesses. In fact, uh, Deb is not here right now because we're integrating a new business into our operation that was not a pre pandemic business, but will be a new business for us. Uh, I'll announce that at a future meeting, but uh, we expect that to be about uh, 500 plus service hours and deliver about $30,000 uh, plus of, uh, uh, of uh, program fees. And we have several others that uh, we're working on as well. So we're, we're well on our way to, uh, to rebuilding the program fees that we, uh, we lost during the pandemic. And then with respect to just turning to community fundraising and pandemic support, uh, we had expected during the plan process this year to resume event fundraisers this fall. Uh, because of the resurgence or the, uh, the impact of, of Delta and the, uh, the inability to uh, assure that we would be able to have uh, uh, events that would not be transmission related events. Uh, we have set aside our event fundraisers for six months and we're hoping that we'll be able to have a, uh, a spring season for event fundraisers. That's going to impact us in our cash flow for the next several months because we would have expected to have somewhere between thirty to fifty thousand dollars of, of uh, event related and, and other uh, fees. Uh, that will probably come later in the year. Uh, and so uh, as we move into other aspects of uh, fundraising and pandemic support, um, you'll see a line item on the, um, on the, fund, on the uh, forecast that suggests uh, ARP, the American Recovery uh, Plan, uh, and that is in reference to some statements that were made in May when we came to uh, uh, present uh, our update then and were uh, told that we might, uh, based upon the uh, food delivery program, we might be in a position to uh, uh, achieve some of, those, some of those funds. And so we've set aside what we thought would be uh, appropriate in order to cover the costs associated with the food delivery program this year. And, um, and with that, as I said, I can go into much further detail, but uh, with respect to the short form that you're looking for, I'll stop here and uh, any questions you have will be more than happy to uh, answer. So I'll start with Leslie. Do you have any questions? It's a very detailed report and a lot of new information. It's a great report this one. Yeah. Um, you know, just when you hit one challenge, the next one comes and the next one comes, the next one comes. But um, but uh, you've been very resilient in working through these. And we, we do ask for a level of service and um, independent fundraising as much as possible. So um, Another challenge is in front of you, um, and um, I, I think as we look to, I think in February as we go forward on budget process and as you go forward on your cash flow needs, I'm sure we'll be talking more. But um, it, it's still a difficult situation, and um, I, I don't have to tell you anything you don't already know. Um, I struggle with the fact that the services you're providing are very important. They're hard to replace with other ways of delivering the service, if you think about it. Um, and so 
it's um, something that I think we as budgeters need to to really figure out what we can and can't support, you know, and how we move forward. Um, and those are all future conversations. But um, I think that, as I said, you've been very resilient. I applaud your efforts for new new clients and uh, and the other means of getting fundraising. Oh, Andy. Uh, Mike, thank you for the update. Uh, so you're forecasting now for the balance of the fiscal year a, a slight profit, which is excellent, uh, and that assumes no, no revenues whatsoever with three uh, relatively large components of your program services, uh, Senior Center River House and uh, Nathaniel Witherall. Do you, is there a possibility that once we get make some progress vis-a-vis the pandemic that these programs may uh, reappear or are you really discounting them out for the balance of the full fiscal year? So for what we've been uh, receiving in terms of uh, uh, information on how the organizations are reopening or how the organizations are um, providing transportation services, uh, Riverhouse, for their non um, uh, their their services that do not relate to the easy access program, which uh, the state provides uh, support and transportation services for, uh, for those uh, residents who do not live within the easy access corridor, uh, Riverhouse has purchased a vehicle. That, and there were only uh, a few that we were uh, transporting. Uh, for that, Riverhouse uh, now has their own vehicle and they're operating uh, their own vehicle for those few individuals. So we wouldn't expect to um, be transporting those individuals unless something changes in the way Riverhouse has decided to, to operate, um, which is why I suggested our, uh, our programs to date going forward is with respect to um, private pay individuals who would like to participate, who are looking for some transportation that's not Riverhouse related, uh, and we would uh, obviously uh, collect fees not from a contract with Riverhouse, but from uh, those private individuals uh, directly. So that, that's Riverhouse. With respect to um, the senior center, there has been no uh, statement yet with uh, their soft reopening or slow reopening that they are in need of a uh, vehicle that will transport roughly 10 individuals on a daily basis that uh, we had been doing pre-pandemic. So once they're fully open, um, we can have those discussions and, and talk about uh, what TAG's role could be going forward. But until they're, they're back to their pre-pandemic levels, uh, those discussions would not take place. And, uh, and with respect to Witherall, I know there's been transition with uh, a variety of their employees. Um, we had actually been transporting in, in multiple situations uh, uh, their employees and, and had uh, suspended on occasion when uh, Witherall had some uh, outbreaks that ultimately once uh, impacted uh, one of our drivers. And, uh, set them out of service for several weeks while they had to recuperate from uh, uh, being uh, uh, being in the same vehicle uh, with folks that had been uh, uh, transmissive. Uh, we had to uh, suspend one more time, and I understand uh, that uh, once uh, all of the uh, issues that uh, and Nathaniel's done a tremendous job at uh, at dealing with uh, uh, with any outbreaks they've had. Uh, once they have um, ultimately uh, completed uh, their uh, changeover, there, there's a tremendous amount of uh, staff change. And with that staff change, what they've now decided is to, uh, instead of having tag vehicles, just continually loop back to the train station in the morning and the evening. Um, most, you know, one 
one or two uh, employees uh, at the same time. So it was uh, somewhat inefficient in terms of uh, providing transportation for their employees. Now they're loading several employees into Ubers or Greenwich taxis or whatever, and it's, it's much more efficient for them. And we understand that. So that's what we expect with respect to uh, um, with respect to Nathaniel going forward as well. But we are available, and in fact, when their uh, drivers, uh, uh, when they did not have, uh, in fact, excuse me, um, when uh, there are vacations, if you will, for uh, the uh, river house drivers, uh, we stepped in and, uh, and helped there where there's a need for uh, special services for group trips and whatever in Witherall, we'll have those as well. So the expectation wouldn't be that we would go down to zero, but relative to our pre-pandemic level, we wouldn't expect anything near those pre-pandemic levels for, uh, for uh, either of those organizations. Thank you. So I have, um, you have a um, slide on your tag board. Uh, or, um, I see you have a new president, I believe, since, or it appears, um, it looks like the old president, at least that was on your sheet, um, is now a past president advisor. And do you have any new board members? The last time we visited, I think you said you were looking for new tag boards, and I see that you still would like two more people. So we're, I'm sure um, Ken Borsak, who's here, will put that in the, his article to make sure that um, people understand that uh, TAG is still looking for some additional two board members. Is this true? Um, that is true. I mean, uh, at the current time, we have a sufficient level of the board to do the, the normal and recurring business. What we get a little stretched thin <laughs> is when we're dealing with uh, fundraising and events and, and uh, of that nature. It's helpful to have a few more board members so that we can share the load uh, throughout the uh, throughout the board. So you're looking for people with those particular skill sets. That would that would be very helpful. But quite honestly, anybody with uh, good skill sets is able to not only do fundraising, uh, but help us in our decision making as well. And we welcome people who are interested in serving the community. So uh, don't just uh, don't just set aside uh, fundraising as the only uh, important item. There are uh, many other skills that we'd be very happy to uh, add to the board as well. Okay, great. And we do have turnover, so you know eventually right. uh, uh, the. Most of our board members have served uh, long and well, and we expect uh, will continue. Uh, you mentioned uh, there has been some changeover. Tony Medico, our, uh, our former board president, most recent board president, uh, and recognized uh, lawyer uh, uh, who uh, serves the town in many capacities as well. Um, he had uh, mentioned based on some uh, business requirements that, uh, in fact, this was just slightly before the onset of COVID in February of 2020, it may have even been January, he asked if, uh, if he could step down. Uh, I had uh, spoken with him and suggested that it would be welcome to have him uh, maintain his role, even though he might not be able to attend all board meetings uh, going forward, and he did so up until uh, a few months back, at which point we made a formal changeover uh, based on uh, on board meeting we had, uh, uh, voting on new officers. And at that point, uh, I was uh, elevated to the president's chair, and I've been serving, I've been basically serving as uh, acting president for quite some time now. Uh, so I was basically elevated into the president's role. Our other officers, as you see, Cindy Koppelman is the vice president. Uh, she's uh, with Miller Motor Cars, the family uh, uh, motor car business has yeah, been in sure. town for many, many years. Uh, Sandy Kornberg, who's got tremendous marketing communicating, communications and advertising skills. He's our uh, secretary. John Mastracchio, who people in town uh, uh, RTM and other uh, town uh, services recognize him that he is the vice chair uh, on the RTM town services uh, as well as uh, uh, working in uh, many other capacities in the community. Uh, and uh, Brian Tunney is our new treasurer. He's, uh, he's uh, 
in the real estate community uh, and has been uh, the treasurer of the Greenwich Association of Realtors uh, and uh, uh, working with many uh, youth, uh, uh, youth sports organizations as well. Uh, Jen and Barbara are both also in the real estate community in town and they've done both uh, tremendous jobs for many events. Uh, uh, Jen in particular uh, has done restaurant week for many years and is responsible for a lot of the events up, up at the Polo Club as well, among many, many others. And they've both donated their time and effort to many other uh, nonprofits as well. And so, um, you know, I, I could go on, on and on in depth, but we, so, have, we so have a wonderful uh, uh, group of board members that we could use a few more to help so, out. So thank you for the update and congratulations on your new position. I don't think we were giving you the right title in our minutes, so we'll, We'll change that. Well, I appreciate uh, and that. so, uh, do you have a, a motion, Jeff? Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to inquire. Um, uh, I'm looking uh, in the packet of paper that you've given us, and I was comparing uh, page the first page, what you call it, SU one, to one of the supporting pages, CF one. Um, and although the totals are the same, the component items are different. On the um, uh, on, on, on the expense side, all the numbers all match. But on the revenue side, um, you're showing that you're depending uh, on the first page uh, on SU1, uh, you're, you're relying on achieving $129,500 worth of fundraising. But on CF1, you're talking about requiring $160,000 of fundraising uh, to make things ba balance. Uh, on the first page, you're showing pandemic support of $95,500. On the interior page, you're showing zero. And I don't get the um, the uh, the program fees and the like to match up either. Although the totals all match and the expense side that all matches. Uh, and I, uh, I I thought maybe when we see you next or something, maybe you could go through that with us and show us how that all dovetails. I don't if need you to do it today. If you have a very short period of time, I could uh, reconcile this very quickly for we you. Won't, we won't take mind. the time today just because our agenda is running long. But I thought. It would be useful to me when we get together the next time. So I'll, I'll just very briefly say that the front page is on accrual basis, and the CF page is cash flow. And the difference between accrual and cash flow, the primary differences are the timing of the recognition of the $65,000 related to the CDBG second uh, award that we received in July. Uh, we accrued for it in June. We received it in July of 21, which would be in our fiscal year 22 uh, for, ca for cash flow purposes, but fiscal year 21 for accrual purposes. On the flip side, we received our second uh, uh, pandemic uh, loan, if you will, uh, from the SBA. 95,500 we received in February of 2021. That doesn't get recorded in revenue until uh, it is uh, forgiven, right. and it's not forgiven into uh, until fiscal year 22. Gotcha. So the difference is $30,000 related right. to those two items, one in one year for cash flow, uh, and the other year for accrual, and the exact opposite. Okay. And we, uh, we can go into it in more detail. Yeah, that's, I, that's, I, that's I, I, would, I would suggest maybe for the, um, I think you come back in December, for the release of conditions, um, perhaps you want to just have a one page to help just reconcile those two pages. So, Jeff, do you have a motion? Uh, I, I would make a motion, well, uh, a motion that uh, for the acceptance of the, uh, well, recommend to the full BET acceptance of the semiannual report of TAG. Acceptance of the semi-annual semi report of TAG. Report of TAG. And Andy do seconds it. So that's Jeff and then Andy. And those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. So we're in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. It's always you, very Mike. informative. We it's, appreciate it. It's my pleasure always. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, based on the fact that uh, much of our fundraising has shifted to the second half of the year, uh, there may be a need for us to come back in advance of December uh, to talk about a potential need to shore up the remainder of 
of this first six months of the year mm. because our expectation was that we would have a substantial level of fundraising, which is not going to happen until uh, later on uh, this year. So I'll be working with uh, uh, and speaking with Ben Branion and uh, should the need be to uh, come back in advance of that December meeting, uh, we'll, uh, we'll let you know and try and be on the uh, agenda. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mike. Thank Good you. to see you. Thank you. Happy fall. President Thanks, and you too. President Mike. <laughs> so our next item on our agenda, um, with a little bit of um, support from the committee, I thought I might, under new business, we, we don't really number them. Um, we just have bullet points, so I suggested we update the update on the parking operations since the deputy chief and is here on that item, and and then we follow on with the economic conditions report so, immediately so, there. So I move we take. I don't even parking. know if we have to move since it's okay. You can move. Yeah, I move that we take the parking services um, uh, operations yeah. report out of sequence here. Thank you. Uh, I move we take the update on parking uh, fund operations uh, out of order and, and hear that now and then return to the other items on the agenda. Okay, good. Uh, I, I second. And those in favor? Well, we all vote. Four zero zero. So, my goodness. So, we welcome. Um, wherever you prefer to stand up there or sit there, that's your choice. Okay. With, you. That's your choice, and you can also move the chairs apart. You know, I'm not sure about the social distancing. We're supposed to keep social distancing, so I'm a little worried about well, that. We're, we're masked up and vaccinated. Okay. Well, um, we um, we welcome you. Um, we have the deputy chief with us. Is this the first time you've been before us? This is. I didn't think you'd been before since you've been promoted. So this is great. And we have Luann Beltoni, and um, they're just going to give us an update on the parking fund operations. They gave us a great detailed report, which we got um, earlier this morning. And, um, I, you know, it's really detailed. So just even, um, you know, a brief um couple of sentences or whatever and how how you're all doing and it must be really tough with all these, you know, COVID changing the parking habits and, you know, the restaurants using up the parking spaces and everything else. So thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I, I wrote down a few things and actually uh, I, basically what I said was that I was hoping to uh, dispense with actually reading that report and just going to some of the highlights. And well, so, I, I would say just, you know, two or three highlights would be great and, you know, um, oh. you know, whatever works best for you. Okay, great. And so I, I would just say this, uh, you know, on the record, right, uh, the town of Greenwich is uh, very fortunate to have an extremely competent and dedicated business service manager uh, with Luann Bellantoni. Um, she's done a great job assisting me with my transition. So, you know, we worked together to make sure that this was as detailed and informative as possible for you to make your decisions. So I think one of the things that I do just want to say is that, you know, when it comes to the meter revenue numbers that we presented, that was a rough approximation of the uh, meter usage. There are a host of individualized factors that affect every single meter's usage, right? Whether it's at the top of the avenue, bottom of the avenue, time of day, what the stores are around it. So, you know, when it, when it comes to that, the numbers were a really rough approximation. Uh, another thing that, uh, you know, is uh, the permits and the commuters. I, you know, obviously I will restate the obvious. Uh, the pandemic has changed everything. Um, the day parking in particularly uh, revenue has changed. Um, clearly uh, we remain optimistic now that New York has opened up that perhaps the day parking will also pick up. But that's, the ground is moving underneath our feet right now as we discuss that. Right. Um, again, there's really no way to, to judge it, but certainly I, I think everyone's work habits have been changed no matter where you are. It will be different post. So uh, with New York City driving so much of the economy, I imagine that that will continue to be a hit. Um, parking permits, um, you know, as noted, right, we had a 25% uh, reduction in the parking, parking permit renewal. Uh, the parking service staff aggressively managed the uh, wait list. Uh, five rounds, I believe it was, that went out. 
to kind of restock the renewal, and that deficit went from 25% to 15%. Now, I just please note that the uh, next renewal season begins October 15th, so we haven't actually started the next series. And uh, again, we don't know where we're going to be with previous permit holders to the new permit holders, but that wait list that we went through reduced the, uh, increased the number to a low 15%. We still have an extensive wait list for those permit parking. Um, we also have the new permit, uh, the Central Greenwich permitting, which didn't exist prior to the pandemic. And again, you know, as noted, this was not as a result of the pandemic, but it happened to mesh well with it um, for um, uh, the, the, the permitting in Central Greenwich, I should say, actually. Um, there's, that was an, excuse me. The Central Greenwich permitting was a new initiative that didn't exist prior to that. It now exists. And that's an additional revenue stream where you have a guaranteed amount of money coming in based upon the permitting. It's been well received. Um, the expectation is that there will be an increase in the number of the actual permits based upon feedback that we got from the merchants as well as some of the uh, real estate agents. Right? And so that number should be also increased, which is just another possibility for revenue. And uh, that's pretty much it, I think. Uh, I think the honest answer is that, you know, we're a little early into the uh, new fiscal year. There's a lot that is changing, uh, not only locally, but regionally. And that, uh, you know, to make any sort of real guess as to where we're going to end up will be a little bit difficult. So Sorry, any I, questions? I think just, you know, the, the point that I just we'll be keeping our eye on the parking fund just because it's the town's only enterprise fund and it's in a unique position from that. So it's different than the other funds we have for Witherall or, um, you know, whatever, school lunch fund or something. So, you know, just sort of keeping our, our eye on the overall bottom line. So we appreciate all the work and the time and effort you went, put into this. And I am not sure if I didn't, did I say that your name was Craig Gray? Did I miss giving out your name when you sat down and I commented about the deputy chief? So if I didn't I think, I comment on your name, I apologize to you. It was, it was yeah. truly an oversight. I began thinking, I worried about it. I don't know whether I did or not. It's so do we have any questions? Logan? Did Andy have? No, well, Andy does do, but I'll start with you. Just because I, I, I saw just, your hand um, first. Thank you. I, um, there's been so much discussion about changes on Greenwich Avenue and sure. the impact on parking. And there's certainly a lot of numbers floating around on, on number of spaces. And I'm not getting into the number of spaces now. But just a more uh, general question, because um, I know when I asked Deputy Chief Marina last year um, that there were a lot of ideas being floated around, but there wasn't a context for them. There wasn't really a strategy or an understanding of what we need or what we want to deliver in terms of parking availability to residents and visitors. Um, is that something, a, a strategy or a, a, a parking strategy really for all of Lower Greenwich Avenue as well as maybe commuter parking, is that something that you can think might be needed that you would consider requesting funding for going forward? For a strategic plan for parking for the avenue. Right. Uh, at this point, I would tell you, Madam, that I haven't really thought about it. At this point, it's managing what we have in place and kind of reacting to what's going on with the uh, pandemic. Um, so I, I, I think the strategic plan at this point would maybe a little bit because of the, the changes that are coming. We're not going to have enough data to make a quick plan. So It is something I'd like you to keep in mind, especially as we're getting more um, building permit and different types of structures affecting that area. We certainly have seen the change of what's going on in Millbank Avenue, but there's so many factors at play, some of that you've identified, but other ones that are coming forward that I think may be a more statistical or a, a, a experiential study might be helpful in considering some of these uh, ideas that are coming through. Right now we're doing trial and error and that works for a while, but um, I think there's some bigger questions that maybe we can handle differently. So just an idea. No, certainly, I understand. You know, meshing the parking services with everything that's happening downtown certainly is a uh, important part of the, the big picture. So. Yeah, and there's a lot of ideas about, you know, Island Beach parking lot and the building that's sitting at the Horseneck parking lot and whether that should remain or become parking. Um, raise questions in my mind, and we don't know what the future of commutation really is going to be, but um, all of those 
decisions or choices that the town has, really parking has to be a big part of that. So, Understood and agree. Andy. Okay, uh, thank you, and thank you for such a thorough report. I love all the numbers that you present, and that gives me an opportunity to ask several questions. Uh -huh. Uh, in your first paragraph, you make a reference that you've uh, incurred a loss of revenue on the bump outs of about $49,000. Oh. And, and that, to me, as I go through the numbers, that implies uh, 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 before the bump outs, those spaces were being used 100% of the time. And, you, and, and, and do you actually have data from the, the old meters in terms of how often they were used? Or, or is that data that... I would I would tell you that that was a, a quick answer. Okay. Uh, it wasn't based upon each. As I said in the very beginning, each one of those um, uh, spaces has a different usage. Uh, so. Well, I, 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 this, I don't know. If this, is, this is not a draft, but I, next time I write maximum estimated loss of revenue. I mean, it's, it's it can't be more than forty nine thousand based on those assumptions, but it could be possibly less. Uh, that's correct, right? And I'm wondering, on uh, these other permits for resident and merchant permits in, in the downtown area, uh, presumably some of this parking, uh, new, newly permitted parking, will take the place of meter parking or take, uh, take away uh, some potential revenues for the town. Uh, there's a cost there. Is, there. is there not? I don't think there's a loss. I think what it is no, is it I'm ensures... Essential Greenwich, I'm sorry. Yeah, Essential go ahead. Greenwich uh, resident and merchant. They're being directed to 12-hour lots. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. So thus it does free up the um, two-hour parking on the avenue. Okay, so it's a net gain then. Okay. And lastly, going back to the commuter parking lots, uh, uh, I, I saw that we had, uh, in 2020, 4,400 permit holders. Uh, I have to ask, how many spaces uh, does that, uh, were those permits given for? Uh, as a former commuter to New York, I often had a permit, but I often could not find a space, and a small aggravation. It's probably not true anymore, but uh, how many spaces does the town manage a lot at the various tra train stations here in town that, for which we give permits? I don't have the number in my head. Do you? Uh, Basically, we've really never had an issue where um, someone couldn't find a spot. I mean, that's news to me, but maybe things have changed over the past two years. I've only been with parking services two years, but um, we make sure we allocate, especially like Old Greenwich. If we, if we never had a situation of not ever having any, uh, anyone not unable to find a space, why do we maintain a wait list? Uh, and why not have more people move off the wait list to, uh, and, and pay for it? total of how many spaces are available. You don't want to oversell. I mean, it's not like the airport, you know, an airplane, you can get bumped to the next flight. Okay, so, so, so what, what is the total? I'm just, just out of curiosity. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't okay, know. okay. Right. And, I, and I think the number that we've been working on is the historical number that was, has always been there. And so we haven't changed the number yeah. of permits that we issue. It's just, this is the number. Yeah, I, I do hope, I do hope the use comes back with uh, people going back to old commutes to New York City. I'm not as optimistic perhaps as some, but it's, uh, it just is, un, it's, un, it's very sad to see these empty spaces uh, at all our train stations that once we're, we're full. So, you know, doing a very good job. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I made a note of that and I'll get back to you with okay. that. And also if I could just make a note that uh, we've also had people saying, oh, why can't you sell more spaces? A lot of those spaces, mind you, permit holders did renew their permit, they just aren't commuting. So spaces are, just because they're not occupied doesn't mean they're available to be issued a permit. So it's just like a mis, misconception. But a lot of people did. And also, as we go through the wait list, um, the deeper down we go, the more, more recent. So if those are the people who more than likely will avail themselves and haven't moved you know, out of the area. So I think once we go to the wait list, we should be able to you know, bridge that gap a little bit should there be less than, you know, uh, I mean, there's never 100% renewal mm -hmm. in 2021. Right. We're hoping a greater than, you know, uh, maybe towards 85 or 90 percent. Okay. This, this Thank you. So I have a question. So what on I, Greenwich Avenue? You know, I live in this. That's my downtown district. So. <laughs> I, for me. Um, so do you know what our average parking? Um, space is in terms of square feet. I mean, nationally, it's 300 to 350 square feet, but no, you don't know that. Um, so, you know, again, um, you know, I, I looked here at um, what we're, um, 
what you're getting per parking space these for these restaurants say that you know or you or the barriers are locking off these parking spaces i think you have the information here the, for the the <laughs> The dining. Uh, the dining, right. Yes. The dining room. All right. It says parking services received. Mm -hmm. You know, talked about the fees collected. I guess right. the ones that go to the VPW get some money, I guess, for the spaces. Correct. It's on in the first, um, on the two page report, it's in the first section. Right, in, it is. In the, in the bullet point that's inserted. Right. right. Yes. DPW receives twelve fifty per barrier foot parking services received. That's what I'm asking. So, so I, I think the point here is that we need to begin to think about you know, and you're doing a very good job in terms of comparing the meter costs, um, but it also creates a different dynamic in terms, in my opinion, of um, what it then attracts to Greenwich um, because. In terms of those kind of square feet and the kind of rent that we get, if you use an average, um, and you're talking about 200 days, which is about 55% of the year, but if you're, if you're even talking 365, um, you're probably talking something in the range of 15,000 to 25,000. So, you know, all of a sudden with all these extra feet too, it, 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 you know, we have to understand the dynamic. Of, of a Greenwich Avenue, I, I would take what Leslie is saying here too, and how that creates um, a change in terms of what it attracts to Greenwich, because it's a very low divide. Three twenty-five by you know three twenty-five dollars per year by say three hundred and fifty dollars per square foot or 350 square feet, you see how much they're paying per year. Anyway, a little complicated for this meeting, but it's something to think about, and we'll put together. Um, generally, when you come before the budget committee, as Luann knows, we put questions in advance. And, and so probably a question on that in terms of how do we actually price these things? And not just the versus the meter, um, but how does that change the dynamics of what it's attracting to Greenwich Avenue when, say, an average restaurant pays a $75, $75 per square foot or whatever they paid in today's environment? Anyway, it's another it's another I day. Want, I want and, to, excuse and, me one I just want to be clear because this is new to me, so I want to make sure that I well, understand. Well, I, I was taking it from what it is looking at the parking meters to what it looks like when you're operating, say, a restaurant and so so forth, and all of a sudden you're getting that space for so much per square foot, and does it attract? Oh. It changed the dynamics, and you know, quite frankly, I strongly supported it because it, it created a dynamic to return that we needed. Um, and we just need to think about these strategically. I think I was following Leslie's point in terms of strategy, in terms of then applying, you know, how we would think from a real estate standpoint um, and applying that to then does that change the dynamics of who you're going to attract? Are you going to attract, you know, pay, get less money for space for a restaurant than you do for a retail? And then that impacts our um, values that we put on our revenue streams from our assessor's office over the longer term. So it's just, you know, again, this is part of that dy dynamic that we if, could If we could I could at. just add to that, because I think, one, you're asking for input or reaction that's greater than just delivering parking spaces, right? Oh, this absolutely. Is, this is a strategy of how we're using and how we're marketing Greenwich Avenue. And um, so I, I just don't want to leave that this is a question that you alone are answering. Exactly. Oh, it's no, not no. you alone. Mm -hmm. There, There is a... There is an economic question of, let's say that this strategy of restaurant bump outs is endorsed and we want to continue it and it's going to be two thirds of the year. Clearly then there's a, a, a pricing component of that that we have to figure out what's the right pricing. The numbers that come to us now look like, you know, we're not charging very much for it because we're getting other benefits that are not into the parking fund for it. But so you're just asking to have that conversation. And that's probably more with the first selectman than it is probably with the parking division, but they're interrelated. Right, but yeah. it all, I mean, you're thinking about these things. I mean, I thought this was a great memo that you put together and I thank you for all the detail and, and work that you put into it. So um, anyway, we thank you for coming. Thank Do we have any more that. questions? Or should we just accept the report? Um, okay, I was gonna ask. I was going to ask just a couple of things. Okay. I mean, my, my, my very bright colleagues have asked almost all the questions I had in mind. But 
Uh, first, I want to be sure that I joined my colleagues to say that this was an excellent report. I don't know if I'm looking at the, you know, thanks for the arrival of Lou Ann, this is terrific, or whether it's uh, the deputy chief, but it's an excellent report, and we really very much appreciate the thought and care that went into it. I had a couple of questions. One, as I listened to the answers from, uh, from Ms. Bellantoni, I, I don't know if I'd call you Lou Ann or Ms. Bellantoni, um, uh, I, 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 I had previously understood that with the commuter parking, we did overbook. We sold a few more permits than we actually have spaces, but apparently that's not the well, case. a few more, but not a tremendous amount where, you know, if on a given day everyone would show up, you know, there, there's a slight amount, not, okay. you know, a tremendous amount. Um, Jeff, I'll confirm that they do overbook. It's sometimes if you go, you know, in the previous days, if you go in for, like, meetings in the afternoon and there's zero spaces there, yeah. Not happy. Yeah, I mean, overbook probably wasn't the right expression for me to use, but you're selling a few more permits than there are actual spaces. Um, the, the valley parking, I'm kind of curious. So if the valley parking drops into, uh, into existence, where are those cars going to be parked by the valet, do you know? And, 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 and how does that affect what we're dealing with here? Underutilized, underutilized uh, 12 hour parking. Uh, yes, and the, and the spots behind Lake Sachs. Oh, we, we looked at what lots are underutilized, and depending on the time of day that the valet um, service would be offered, we only enforce till 5 p.m. If they begin their valeting 4 or 5 p.m., then they have access to the lots. Nice. But this is all being formulated so, and, and dis, you know, will be discussed with the vendor to tie it up. Quite clever. Then, uh, th thank you. I have nothing else. Okay, great. So, do you have a yeah, motion tell you what, to accept the uh, yes, report? Yes, let's, let's let's do that. Um, uh, so, I would uh, move that we accept the update of the parking fund operations report uh, by the deputy chief um, and recommend its acceptance by the full BET and call this item uh, routine, so we don't have to bring you back again to the BET. <clears throat> I'll okay. second. Sorry. Okay, so we have Jeff making a motion and, and routine. Wesley Moriarty, and it's routine. Those Aye. in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so that's 400. Thank you both Thank very you. much. Thank you very yeah. much for having um, me. For, for coming and um, visiting with us. And we'll see how things go, but I expect that, you know, things go well, then we'll see you try and combine our meeting so we don't see you both in. December and <laughs> not too often. That do one in January if that works out. Thank you both. Thank you so Thank much. You. Okay, so Roland, you've been very patient, and now we have our economics conditions report. Talk into the mic. Okay, so July and August conveyance taxes are both over a million dollars. And building permits, uh, August was one of the highest uh, in quite a while. So those continuing to do well. The other earnings start to get a little bit skewed. We had $44.5 million more collected for taxes through August than we did a year ago. We had that deferment uh, in place, and we didn't collect those taxes until October sometime. We had some bridge money, about $5 million. Uh, in July and August of this year that we didn't have last year. And that accounts for probably the biggest part of the revenue Five variances. Million. Five million uh, bridge revenue. Party time. <laughs> In terms of the expenditures, uh, we're pretty much along with last year. Uh, the health care is the timing difference in terms of when the uh, health care bills were paid. Uh, the only other significant difference is in education where the single biggest uh, increase this year versus last year is about a half a million dollars of cybersecurity money that was paid, which obviously wasn't even in our budget a year ago. Right. So we're going to have to keep track of that. We moved um, some uh, money, Jeff, from uh, capital into operating. I assume that's what we're talking about. Is that what we're talking about, Roland? Yeah, so we moved almost $4 million uh, into operating, so we should expect to see a higher expenditure level in this year versus last year as we go forward. So um, I did have a question. Does anyone have any questions on all this? I, Roland, can you just explain, is 
back on pa the page uh, one, two, three, four, the bottom number of the general fund, Nathaniel Witherall. What is that? Says so H. What? I, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the one, two, three, fourth page from two other, Nathaniel Witherall says. Uh, okay, that was, that's the benefits that we charge them each month. So through August, so the August uh, benefit wasn't recorded until September. So that's why you kind of see a little okay. difference. Okay. There. It's, it's just the timing difference. The benefits onto their book. Yeah. Well, no, but the difference was, if you look at it, you know, comparing the different years, Jeff, there was a right. difference. Each, each month's about $400,000. You can see last year was 800. This year it's only 400. Okay. So just a disparity in timing between the two years. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and um, I think the point that we've gotten, um, I guess we see the pluses and the minuses of the COVID and perhaps one of the pluses for Greenwich um, has come in our first page in conveyance and building permits. Uh, Leslie? Um, just two things. One, I, I, can you prepare these same charts for the end of fiscal 21, just so we have all of the 21 data in place? I can't put my hand on whether I, we distributed I them. I thought I did, or maybe it's just a faulty memory, but yeah, I'll do that. I, I can't recall whether we looked at them in July or not, but I, they're not in the packet, so they may have been in a separate handout. Um, and then just nomenclature, you know, I, I took a quick look at this and I said, gee, is he doing August 21, January year to date or fiscal year to date? So maybe you want to just make sure you indicate that it's the fiscal year to date as we look at this. Um, and uh, I think part of the confusion was I didn't want to say this. Maybe the top of the columns aren't labeled updated. They were on the last page, but not necessarily in the earlier ones. Yeah. I just but, didn't want to say that in the public plaintiff. But yeah, we'll have to figure out a way as we go through the year to, to identify what the, the uh, budgetary, or I, I guess the actual changes year over year uh, based on our move from capital to operating. But um, the, the impact and the changes as we have in our operations going from kind of a no pre-pandemic to the pandemic to post-pandemic is going to be challenging. It's challenging already. Mm -hmm. So, any more questions for Roland? Andy. Uh, 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 Roland, on the going up to the conveyance taxes for so far this fiscal year, I was really kind of surprised to see how large it is. Uh, and it, it, it augurs well for you know, higher building permit fees, say, next year. You know, there's always a lag there. Anyway, was, was there a, a, a couple of large uh, entities that, that pumped it up so much to two and a half million? I knew, I know in August there was a, a $35 million sale. I, I can't quite remember what it was, but uh, Tom Crook said there was That's right. one large That's sale. right. Anyway, it's, it's good, and that's yeah. good for the fund balance, right? So, um, I guess I will mention it here because I sometimes mention it in economic conditions. The, um, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics number came out today as, you know, this is sort of the time, but it came out a little earlier today and we look at our own area. And it actually had an unusual statement on it, but um, just so that we know, for the one month, um, it ticked up 0.1%. Um, and what, again, what are we talking about? the Bureau of Labor Statistics inflation eight, oh, inflation for our area, which is usually sometimes we talk about this. Um, but you know, the area inflation actually increased by um, three point seven percent. But there was an unusual statement here about um, the costs of um, energy, largely attributed to higher prices for energy and um, data of report are not seasonally adjusted, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, um, I do think that that was interesting. Um, and we haven't looked at these numbers since the last couple of months. So um, but it'll, it? It, I think that the Fed chairman has basically said that inflation is going to moderate to 2%. 
and it's pretty much we've been um, I think it was reconfirmed um, on the overall national statistics that it is moderating today, but um, it didn't seem, you know, again, it's com the extra comment here I just noticed was, you know, attributable to energy costs. And it actually went on to say that energy prices jumped by 21.7%. And I assume it has to do with the hurricanes and the problems that they had getting the um, various and sundry energy products up here to the northeast our little itty bitty corner. Yeah, but just to add to that observation on the CPIU, um, it, inflation has been increasing in our area since January on that one statistic, right? So um, on, starting in January, there was a steady incline that maxed out in June. It declined for one month and then went back up. So we've gone from a level of one point I don't know, two five percent approximately in January to the three point seven that it's now on a twelve month average. So I don't know if you can make any um, any global comment that it's going to moderate around two. I think there's a lot of factors at play there, and and we're in an inflationary. Well, we'll see over the next month or two. I so, agree. We don't know. But so, so, so sharing for a moment, just because I saw a notation this morning in the draft that you sent about the 2%, and I look back. Well, wait a second. Oh, I, I look back at the report, if I can, please. Uh, I look back at the report uh, of the Fed Chairman Powell on August 27th, uh, and uh, the data points that he actually says, since you're quoting to him, was that the uh, core inflation uh, for the current year should be running at about 3.7%, it would drop then to 2.2% in the following year, and then to 2.1% in the year following that. Um, the um, the uh, 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 consumption expenditures inflation, the numbers were slightly different, 4.1% for the current year, followed by 2.2%, and then 2.3%. So looking forward, as we as the conversation shifts to guidelines, I don't think Chairman Powell is saying that he's expecting for uh, fiscal year 23 to be running at 2%. It looks more like he's talking about 2 and a quarter percent, 2.3 percent. It's not a lot of difference, but it's a little different than the 2 percent, which was reflected in your draft, and that's worth knowing, I yeah, think. Yeah, I, I had a different quote, so, you know, whatever. But it's, I agree, the inflation is up, Jeff. Yeah. We're going to see, you know, um, he is talking about a moderation. We've had certain blips due to energy and whatever, and um, we're just going to have to all work together and see what happens, as we always do. So now we will move on to um, budget guidelines. So, Jeff, maybe you actually let us in, led us into that. So, and I have moved these things around. Can you just give me one second so I can pull mine up? Because I've been. I, let me make a request at the threshold of this uh, before we begin to talk about uh, content on this. Um, uh, it, it's not necessarily what we usually do, though we have done it from time to time. But um, I'm a little uncomfortable with an arrangement where uh, I'm receiving uh, a, an exhibit one the night before a meeting and the text material uh, an hour before the meeting. Um, uh, and that's called the first read. And then when we come back uh, for our October meeting, that's, I guess, supposed to be a vote on guidelines. I think what I'd like to propose, if I can, I don't know how my colleagues feel about it, is I think it will be interesting to have a brief dialogue today but I'd like to propose that there be an additional meeting, a special meeting between now and our October meeting, in which we have, in which I, I have the opportunity to look at this in a little greater depth, talk to some of my very clever colleagues um, in my caucus and yours, um, and then have a, a lively dialogue with each other about uh, this figure is great, but I'm not comfortable with that figure because, and listen thoughtfully to your replies and things. Uh, and then maybe so, so that dialogue can be separate from the rather precipitous meeting in which we're actually voting on the guidelines. I think that would be good use of our time, although I hate to have extra meetings. Okay. So, so I'm sorry to jump in on, on the threshold of it, but I'm uh, feeling a little uh, aggrieved at the short notice of things that I'm looking at. And this I view to be a very important subject, not something to take lightly. And so I want to, I want to address this in a little more careful way than perhaps other, we might otherwise do. So that's reasonable, and I thought it was a courtesy to everyone to get it out today. Um, as you know, um, 
uh, we've been working on the numbers and there was a issue raised yesterday and it was absolutely on the mark and we had to have a correction. And then I held the, I would have gotten them out earlier, Jeff, but I had to go back and change so many I, different numbers I, I, in, the, in the text. I'm not, but, 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 I'm not but I, 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 would, I would just say that, you know, there, would, there are years when they've been handed out at the meeting and I wanted to make sure everyone had it in advance. But I think, um, I think in terms of, you know, concerning them and talking about them and so forth, I, I'm very open to all that too. So, you know, um, I really, um, this is really a first read. Um, and, um, you know, I don't know, I really hadn't planned to say much about them. So, you know, myself, um, you know, I think like um, Roland is, and, and Pete are both masters at this too. And I want to thank all the work and dedication that um, both of them have put into this. Um, so thank you publicly. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy now to, you know, take a budget that's, you know, so large, almost a half a billion dollars just for the general fund. And, um, you know, anticipated, I think, you know, we sort of alluded to it a bit that, you know, sort of wrapping up last year was a bit harder. Um, fiscal year 21, because of all these things, um, we're now in fiscal 22, and it's um, with all the COVID money and issues. So um, overall, if we want to talk about just general things, um, the operating costs um, in general, um, with salaries and, and, you know, general, most wages are budgeted in here to increase at... Um, Two and a quarter percent, more or less, and um, uh, and that fits with the union contracts. We've kind of, Roland's been working on this, not specifically every person, but um, did a spreadsheet to see on average um, what it worked. About you know, basically weighting the the um, either the contractual or anticipated, um, and also um, in here the teachers have been. Um, their wages were separately um, documented in here at 2.94%, um, which is um, their contractual costs. Um, and the adjustments are made, you know, when, um, in terms of new positions and so forth, similarly. Um, other salary costs, and the rest of the hundreds are at, are at, at two and a quarter percent, um, which Jeff, I think you indicated was sort of where the Fed chairman thought he might be. Um, and then the, the rest of the 200s to the um, 800s um, were at 2%. So, um, you know, that's just general. Everyone's going to have lots of time to think and talk about it, and we will be talking. There's, there's no question about that. Um, in terms of going through health care, um, all of that, um, has all been documented with the best numbers that Pete and Roland think are available. Um, pension contribution is going up very substantially. Um, it's been inclusive of the um, strong gains we had, but also um, at this point in time, we don't know what the retirement board's gonna do, but um, the drop in the rate of return to 6%, um, and then also the very expensive, um, Cola for the um, the fi the fire and their recent um, concluded um, contract. Um, so that incorporates all of that with the numbers from the actuary that we've seen so far. Um, the risk fund is currently at um, around um, close to five million dollars. Um, so that's basically flat. Um, Nathaniel Witherall um, for various Andy. I can speak to this, but basically um, uh, put in 750000 for this year, but um, the 3.7 um, incorporates their losses for, um, you know, that will be audited to the best of Pete and Roland's um, numbers. This is what we expect to see. Um, school lunch is similar, similar you know, same kind of loss for the year. And again, incorporating their loss for this past year of, uh, well, fiscal year 21, when it's audited of a, approximately that number. Um, fixed charges were um, basically um, what they thought they would be. And um, we have allocated um, 
benefits according to the unions and so forth as, as Roland did last year. And I think that everyone thought that was very beneficial. Um, we've budgeted current year construction projects at, at um, six, basically 64 million at the same level um, as last year. Um, I think last year we all in budget guidelines had um, $55 million. This is up, but we have a large lag of, pro of projects in arrears, um, much greater than we've had other years at this time. Um, what we did do was we used $5 million from capital non-recurring, which would be used against that. That number is around 12, uh, just under it, but there. Um, and the um, debt service um, as proposed. Um, the borrowings and um, keeping um, the capital tax levy flat, knowing that um, the current model has substantially higher um, capital, and you know, can go through that in more detail and see what that looks like. Um, so, going on to the funding, the use of the fund balance on a combined basis is identical to to um, what we had last year, but it shifts. Um, part of it is to use towards the, you know, balancing the budget. The other is to basically um, it funds. Um, the losses for last year for Witherall and um, the school lunch fund. So, and um, um, can I just finish? And then sure, you can sorry. certainly. Um, so that's that. Um, we had other um, revenues. I think we've seen some of these revenues are going to come are coming in higher, much higher. We're collecting things. We're doing a better job at that. But that's you know done at the same inflation rate as we have other expenses, two percent. Um, so nothing particularly fancy there. Um, uh, you know, kept basically ta tax settlements, all the rest similar to last year, um, and showed a grand list increase of 0 0.74, um, which is um, a number, I mean, Lauren actually came up with a number of 250 million, so we backed into that number. And um, as you can see, building permits are phenomenally strong, and so that's probably conservative. This does not reflect the rebound or any increase in the portfolio for that. Um, this is simply um, probably based on the building permits conservative number, and at the moment, just using these numbers, which everyone can discuss, um, comes in at a... Um, at this point in time, it's just a number of 2.74. So, you know, going from there, um, just quickly, um, the, the budget guidelines, um, actually, when you look at it, it's got fewer words than last year. Um, some of, um, we tried to be, um, show the, the positive things that have happened in the, in the past year. Um, you know, I think, one thing we have to do is recognize the great work done by all the town employees um, in a very difficult environment. And also, I would say, the town volunteers. Um, and, um, and then we, we've highlighted some things, but you know, again, I, you know, I think it is going to be a much um, more upbeat year, and um, hopefully, um, Positive. So I tried to pick highlights of that, and you know, we have lots of time to discuss it. So I'd like to propose that we meet um, a week from tomorrow, next Wednesday, the twenty second of September. I don't know what people's schedules are. I'm asking them to take a look at their schedules. Uh, I don't particularly. I have an evening meeting that that day, but otherwise my schedule Wednesday, is open. Wednesday, the twenty second of December. Yeah, uh, September? Uh, September. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just picking days out of the air. I'm, I'm happy to do it on a lot of other yeah, days too. But let's do it offline because I yeah, um, I, I it, want to look what, at my calendar too. Well, yeah, but I want to be sure it gets done. I mean, you, you went through a number of figures that, uh, as I looked at it, there are a number of figures that I feel like uh, what you were using here was aspirational, uh, and I think the process of budget guidelines is not to be an aspirational document. It's to be a reflection as a matter of practicality of where we think we're going to be, whether we like those realities or not. Uh, and with that in mind, there are a number of figures that I looked at that I wasn't comfortable with. I do you a disservice to start talking about figures now 
when frankly um, I may be dissuaded from conversations that I have as to some of my numbers, or I'm, others may be pointed out that I've overlooked and didn't realize that there uh, is a, a discrepancy there too. So I'd like to, instead of having a dialogue about the figures now, I'd like to sit down in this work session that I'm proposing and have do a little prep work before we get there and then have a healthy dialogue on a line by line basis on where we think um, the correct guidelines should land. And so with that in mind, I'm keen to, uh, uh, there's only four of us, we have our schedules in front of us, I think. Uh, let's, let's talk about setting up a meeting and getting down to business on this and do this right. I mean, um, you said, I'm sorry, Jeff, you said next Wednesday. I, I'm just proposing something out of the air, but just to get the conversation started. But I'm looking at, uh, I, I've got lots of time on Wednesday the 22nd. It's a week from tomorrow. If that's too speedy, I'm happy to do it in the following week as well. I'm, you know. I think sooner rather than later is I think is sooner better. rather than later, too. And if nothing else, it would afford the opportunity to have still a further meeting if we wanted to. Although I don't see the necessity for that. I think it's better we get through the um BET meeting from Monday and just it, it works out. Oh, no, it doesn't. That does, I'm so. The BET meeting, meeting is, is the Monday the 20th. So this will be two days right. after that. Yeah, two days afterwards. You, you said are, something about sooner. I think that that's a good time amount of time. I'm not. I'm not available um, the early part of that week. I um, may be available on Friday, but I am not even sure about that. Friday the 24th. Yeah, but I, I I'm not. 100% sure about that. Um, so, Andy, what's what might design? work well for you, Leslie? Well, I, I, I wonder if we could see how the Monday meeting goes at BET before we actually try to schedule a spe special meeting for our, t our, our committee. I um, think this is the relationship. Sorry. Well, We're talking uh, about guidelines only. So, it's not a topic for discussion for the full BET. Well, that's right. This will not be on, on the mm -hmm. agenda. Sorry, my mistake. So is there a so a, so um, Jeff? I think it's fair to say you've raised a point. We're we're agreeable. We're going to come up with a date, and we'll let, make sure it gets plenty of publicity. And we'll come up and when Leslie checks her schedule and whatever, and she'll let us know in the next I, I could do twenty-four it hours. Monday afternoon, the twenty-seventh, if that works. Um, it, it does go into the next week, but it's the first day of the next week. It works for me. We 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 all have um, RTMs at night. Oh no 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 yes. Uh, sure, the 27th, Monday the 27th. Would somebody like to propose the time? That, that works for me. One o'clock? Yeah, let me see. Uh, Andy, what, does the 27th work for you? That works. Yeah. Um, one o'clock on the 27th? Yes. But if I can make a comment too, Leslie. Let me just write this down, Leslie, but otherwise I will... And is it fair enough to call it a workshop? Uh, whatever you like, sure. Okay, the workshop? Yep. Okay. Leslie. Now, I just wanted to comment to, to make sure it's understood um, that the document that the draft that was distributed is primarily your work, working with the financial staff, but it's the assumptions that uh, you've put into this model. You have shared your Exhibit 1 with me along the way, and I appreciate that. Thank you. But I haven't yet. Um, given you any specific feedback on numbers on here. And just like Jeff, I have some concerns over some of the assumptions being made that we'll talk about and work through. Um, I also want to put it into the context because the document of guidelines always talks about these as guidelines. It's using the information we know now. But when we get to decision day in February, March, and, and April sometimes, the guidelines seem to be used as a cap. You've been, you're above the guidelines, you know, justify yourself, get back to the guidelines. The capital number is not based on any real information that we have. The capital number for fiscal 23 capital in the fiscal 22 budget is 94 million. Now we know that that was not also um, arrived at in a scientific manner because when the BET takes actions and reduces things from a capital budget, it's just placed in the next year and there's no work done to then potentially move next year's projects out another year. So we know that that number is not necessarily a real base, okay. but 
just saying current year project gets rolled over next year. So, so there are a lot of assumptions built into here. Um, the use of fund balance uh, assumption is always arrived at questionably. Um, risk fund assumption, I think, needs to be talked about further. The Nathaniel Witherell assumption is kind of also a, a new number out there. So there's a lot of things here to talk about. This is now in the public venue. I don't want it to to be left that this was we, a, a jointly created document. I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I'm glad that Jeff made the suggestion he did for a workshop so we can work through this to try to figure out is there some common ground we can find and what the message is out there. But, um, you know, multiple years of approaching this um, as guidelines and then they're used as caps can continue to make me uncomfortable on how we use this document. So it makes it much more important to find where we can have common ground and hopefully we can reach it. We may not be able to in all cases. Um, and so I'll figure out how to move forward. And I just wanted to put the document into context. And again, appreciate the work that you've done, that the support you've gotten from the finance staff to get here um, and we'll continue to work. And, and Leslie, I agree with you. I mean, it, this is the, the process that this um, budget committee and BET has used to develop the guidelines, really, um, I guess sometimes since Roland can help us, since 2001 or 2000 Roland or something, whether that's the right process or not. But it, it, this is, you know, the first read and whatever. We've used this for the most part. And, you know, you did when, when you know, you were chairman. Um, and so um, I agree. Um, a lot of work and time and effort will will be um, spent over the next week or two or three. So, and um, so I, I you know a... we'll we'll you know we'll talk and 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 work it out. And I mean, I remember that's what happened last year, but in a much shorter time even. So you know um, so Andy, I have, do you have some comments? I have, I, I've already heard from Jeff. I want yeah, I would make two requests if I can. I'm sorry. Uh, I the, call on Andy, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. Andy? Uh, I, have, I have a question. When will, when will we have a final or, not, or a good estimate for the uh, reval number? Would, would it be later this winter? What, reval? Probably right. not until budget, the budget uh, discussions in February. Yeah, I mean, so we'll, we'll, um, too late for this. I mean, but, We'll have a number that will come out, I suppose, you know, it takes a while um, in November, but then people get together with the rebel companies. That's the first step. And then they get together and they go to the BAA. And by then, um, I think the, the um, assessor signs off on the grand list and, and don't, I'm on, on record here, but I believe it's on around January 31st, I assume that's for a reval year as well as a regular year. Can I just make a comment? Because I think you raise an interesting point for the guidelines that the BET needs to be cognizant of. So the revaluation is going to have two components. One is to incorporate the traditional use of building permits and new projects and construction that we get year to year between the revaluation. But it will also change the total valuation for existing properties. I think when we're looking at budget guidelines, um, we want, you know, I mean, our first, maybe the initial assumption, which is up for discussion in March, is to use the traditional approach, which is it's a zero sum game, that the BET typically hasn't increased its tax proceeds by taking a little bit of increased valuations in town. We would take, the total valuation that we have before, the total tax revenue we need, and figure out what the mill rate would be to generate that with a different denominator or a different size of the grand list. But for guidelines purposes, what is relevant is the growth in the grand list from typical ways. So I think showing just the typical growth is really what we do want to look at for guidelines. Uh, to say so, this, to, so, to say the same thing a different way, Andy. The second component of, of what uh, uh, Mrs. Moriarty was speaking about is just the shifting of value back and forth to different neighborhoods and different properties. Uh, that Riverside may become more heavily taxed, back, back country may be less heavily taxed, or something. But that's the zero sum game. The new dollars are the dollars that result 
from the building permits and the like. And that number is baked into the estimate uh, that you're looking at from, uh, yeah, I spoke with, um, uh, with yeah, the 250,000 that you were talking right. about. Yeah, um, uh, uh, it, that's baked into the numbers that you're looking at on the Schedule 1, the Exhibit 1, that Mrs. Tarkington has proposed. I have two requests. Well, I, 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 I want to amend that. It's a, it's a conservative approach to it. What we haven't done is taken the building permits and compare them year over year. And as Roland pointed out today, or you did too, the strength in those. So it hasn't been taken to refine that. It's just been taken a general number to look at at so, this point so in time. I, and I, then I would also just add to your comments, Jeff, that in addition to what you're saying, there has been an overall you know, market covering inflation, increases in value, whatever we want to call it, of, of all of our residential real estate in one generic thing. And this does, we haven't taken into um, consideration any of that either. So, you know, just as a, as a pure comment on that. Yeah, for what it's worth, I went back to the tax assessor and had to do a quick review of the records and give me a figure of what the estimated grand list is expected to be if there were no revaluation, which is to say all of the present value plus all of the building permits and the like uh, to come up with a number and she ran the math and that's the 0.74 of a percent uh, of increase that you're seeing. It matched exactly what Mrs. Tarkington had. I have the feeling we had the same source for that, but I don't know that for sure. Um, uh, I have two requests, if I may. Um, the draft of the uh, Exhibit 1 uh, in its present form was sent out by Roland uh, just to the Budget Committee members. That happened at 724 this morning. Uh, the draft of the text of the um, uh, of the guidelines, that first draft of Mrs. Tarkington, uh, that was distributed by Mrs. Tarkington at 12:01 this afternoon, or at least that's the time on my email that I received it. It has not gone to the other members of the BET, uh, and I think yes, to the best of my knowledge, Shira distributed that to the other members of the BET and posted it. If that's not correct, then we need to fix that. My, it's not posted? And, and my email shows Sorry, this. Sorry, didn't post it then. I apologize. Yeah, my, my email shows this uh, as being sent to, uh, from you to uh, Leslie Moriarty, uh, Andy Deuce, and, uh, and I, as well as copies to Peter Minarski and Roland Geiger. I'm in, unless you sent a separate email to the other members of the BET. No, I didn't. I sent it to Shira to, to distribute and post. Yeah, I don't, I, it doesn't matter how it happened. I just think it, it would be appropriate between now and the 27th when we meet that all the members of the but BET we, have we, received an opportunity to review the Exhibit 1 and the draft text so they can have an opportunity for it their should, input. It, it, it will be posted tomorrow morning, Jeff. There's, oh, there's no question about it. If great. it hasn't been posted, it will be posted. That's there's great. copies over there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for anyone who came to this room. And uh, secondly, can we, um, uh, uh, Pete, can I ask that you arrange for us to have a room uh, to use for that special meeting on the 27th? Well, I'm sorry, you're not the chairman. I will work on these things, Jeff, and right. you and I and okay. Leslie and, and Andy will work in the interim good. and we'll see what we need and what we need to accomplish. Okay, good, okay? good, 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 good. I know I'm not the chair. <laughs> so please, Andy, I mean, Jeff, you've overstepped your line on this All particular right. one. Okay, um, I've tried to always, so do we have any other comments? Are we ready to um, approve the minutes? Yeah. Or, you, or you, is there something else you want, anyone? Minutes, are we ready to move? I have, I have one additional comment which uh, was just given to me during the meeting on the minutes. I just wanna pull them up um, if we can make the change. Was there not a cha the change you wanted? I think um, a reference to um, the new member on the retirement board didn't properly reflect the RTM, but I'm trying to pull up the, um, the set of minutes on the packet right now. I thought uh, they were circulated within a day or two of the July meeting I, with the, my changes, and I know I got your changes today, and yeah, I tried to I, incorporate them. I, and I appreciate that, and I did not look at them until they came out in the packet, my, uh, my delay. But it refers to Ms. Ms. Fredericks as an RTM member. She's a former member. 
So can we can we make the? Can you uh, just put it here it, where on, you want it to change? It's we'll right on page. I think it's six of the actual minutes. I can write it down. But so I'll move the minutes. Uh, and we'll make as the change in the morning. By that, uh, just, just write it on my thing, and then we'll make the change. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm making a motion now to approve the minutes that were circulated this morning with one additional minor okay. change. Yeah, did you do a second that? Okay. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Andy seconds Okay. Thank you, Pete, Roland, record? whatever. <laughs> Sorry. Wait a second. Who did the? You, who did the? Uh, Frederick has no S. No, wait it's a Pamela second. Frederick. Wait, wait a second. The adjournment was you and I moved Andy. to adjourn and Andy seconded. And who did the minutes? Leslie and then? Uh, hi, Sean. How are you? Hi, Sean. Oh, my God. Thank you, Pete. Mm -hmm. I, 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 didn't, I didn't mean to be steady. I'm doing my best to work this will be a loaded subject, these and guidelines. The way, you know, I go back. I never even had the courtesy of getting what the during those two years. Okay? I've done my best. I'm not critical of you. I only. only oh, yeah, but then you just think I'm not going to do this. And Andy moved the minutes. And, and Andy, I believe, seconded. And, it was not and, me. And, and on the adjourn. Uh, you, uh, you I move to adjourn and Andy second. I want to make sure I have everything before this is okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> There's no S on Frederick.